It almost never happens when you get a drug pulled off the market, especially a blockbuster drug that stays in the process. That's a story, Brent. You have to revisit your bias and story and start from scratch. So stories can break, stories can change, stories can shift. Obviously, you're working under a time constraint. You can't keep letting the story shift and change. I want to let you nail your story down and move on. But remember, this is not the end of your story. So if you want to keep tracking your company after this class is done, you're going to see an evolving story, good news, bad news. And I think that's the advantage of having done a base valuation is now you can adapt your story as you go. So today I want to talk a little bit about you know, this morning's class in corporate finance. We had ended the class with the valuation because valuation is end game of corporate finance. In this class, I'm going to reverse the process. We've talked about valuation all through the class. I'm going to bring in some corporate finance into this class. And I'm going to talk a little bit about enhancing that. I know how many any of you planning to work for consulting firm? You can say they or even work for and what kind of consulting do they do? Okay. <laughs> because consulting, especially the high-end consulting, is called value consulting. And here's how it works. Your company is struggling in terms of value. The stock price is not going up. I call in McKinsey and I say, look, tell me what I can do to make my value go up. What, what kind of actions can I take? In fact, this today's session is all about changing value rather than estimating value. How do we change the value of a company? Hopefully upwards. Because you could have a perverse objective. How can I you know, reduce the value? Hopefully that's not the end game you play. So we're going to talk about value. So to set up that process, I'm going to start off with, this, with, with some, some questions about value enhancement that I think will kind of identify where we're going to go to change that. I'm going to list out a series of actions, and I want you to tell me which of these actions will enhance value and which will have no effect on value. A stock split. What does it do for value? Nothing. Cash flow growth is nothing changes. Stock dividends, same effect. You're changing the number of units. How about amortizing goodwill? Last week, Teller Dog did this big goodwill in Paris. Is it affect that? In what way? Maybe the cash flow or the value or their asset was much higher. In the past, mistakes being made. All the goodwill impairment does is it says, look, you made a mistake three years ago. It doesn't affect cash flows. Now it's not tax deductible. You can't go back and reverse that decision. It's an admission of past failure, right? By itself, impairment of goodwill is a neutral action. It affects nothing. Unless it changes your view of this management's capacity to do future acquisition. Because that's really the message, right? We read and look at a company, constantly keeps impairing goodwill. What is this telling you? We don't have any idea what we're doing when we do acquisition, and we're going to keep doing that. And you have to incorporate that into your value, but the effect is going to be that effect it has on future actions. The, the impairment by itself is not the news. It's a signal it tells, tells you about management incompetence that's now going to get built in the evaluation. How about changing the pretty many, many US companies have two sets of books. It's perfectly legal. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. You can have one set of books for the tax guy, it's called the tax book, and another set of books which are reporting tax. And they actually can adopt different depreciation methods in the two books. Now remember, when you take on accelerating depreciation, you reduce earnings and increase cash flow. From a cash flow perspective, value is what's driving. Now, many companies adopt accelerated depreciation. The tax books get the higher tax benefits, but when you use accelerated depreciation because your earnings are going to be impacted, your earnings will be also low in your report. And managers think stockholders are stupid. So if your earnings are lower, they're afraid you will react badly. So what if I go just into my reporting box and change from accelerated to straight line depreciation? In other words, the tax books, I still use accelerated depreciation. In my reporting box, I report the straight line depreciation. What is that going to do? It's going to allow me to report higher earnings that day without doing it. Does that affect that? Not if it's only the reporting books. Then if I changed in the tax books, then you should fire me on the spot because it affects value in a very bad way. 
if I go from reporting from, from accelerated to straight line depreciation in my tax code, I will end up with lower tax code. Guys, whoever's got their mic on, could you please turn it off? So reporting in tax service, only the reporting book, no effect on that. In the late 90s, many companies, including the New York Times, created what was tracking stock. So what they would take is they take a business that was sexy, that everybody wanted to be in. At that time, it was a dot-com business. And they said, look, we have an online version of the New York Times. We're going to create tracking stock where effectively you get a piece of this really exciting business. So imagine coming into your New York Times shareholder. Before they issued the tracking stock, what did you own? You own the New York Times and you own the New York Times online. Now that I've issued tracking stock, what do you want? You want a share of the New York Times and you own a share of the tracking stock. Collectively, there's no effect on the company. You still have the same company. Everybody still owns the same business. It's not like they're starting a new business issuing tracking stock. They're just taking something that they already do. Today, this is from dot com, your platforms. Many companies want to take their platforms and monetize them. Many are actually trying this pattern, creating equivalent of tracking stock where the platform is being customized. And finally, and so the answer is none of these actually affect value if you think about cash flows problems. May I ask a question? Could those affect price? Absolutely. A stock split can affect price. Why? For whatever reason, people you know think that this might be some kind of a signal for the future, and they say, you know what, if they split their stock, it must mean that the stock price is going to go up. Once in a while, you'll have a fairly rational reason, which is by splitting your stock, you make it available to a wider group of investors. But that's a pricing argument, right? It's a demand supply argument. Every single one of these actions can have a price. <laughs> the reason I think that is whenever I get somebody calling me, can you tell us how to enhance value? Before they go on, I said, do you want me to talk about enhancing value or enhancing price? So the kinds of actions you will have to take to increase your stock price might be very different than the kinds of actions you might want to take to increase that. So we'll come back and talk about the contrast between value and price. This is something I talked about last session, but I want to kind of reinforce it. You have a multi-business company. Each business is very different economic characteristics. So let's say you're four businesses. And if you look at the returns, they're widely divided across the business. So division A is a 20% return on capital and the worst division in terms of return on capital is 3% return on capital. I've also given you the cost of capital. So there are two businesses that are value creating, one business that's value neutral and one business that is value destroying. You come in as a CEO and you say, I want to increase the value of my company. Which of these four businesses should you sell? And where is your value enhancement going to come from? Think about the second question before you answer the first one. So the first one, it looks obvious, right? What's every strategy going to say? Get rid of your bad business. But what is it that determines the effect on value of your best business? What do I have to come by? What are the two numbers? If I divest something at its fair value, what's the effect on my value of the best business? Zero, right? The effect on value comes not from whether you're selling a good business or a bad business, but whether you're selling it for more than its value to you as a continued business or less. Now, do you see why often the very best business to sell is not your worst business, but your best business? What are you hoping for? That people get so dazzled by what you made last year and how well this business is growing that they will overpay for the company. In fact, a lot of companies are thinking restructuring said exactly the wrong business. From the last session, we talked about the best acquisitions are of subsidiaries of companies trying to get rid of them. This is what happens when somebody comes and says, just get rid of your bad business. Doesn't matter what price is, give them away. So we're going to talk about these and other things you can do to enhance value, but let's start with this. By, by looking at the contrast 
between value enhancement and price. I'm going to show you the results of a study that was done like 25 years ago. And there's a reason I'm going to start. This study actually looked at companies in the late 90s that changed their names. Companies sometimes change their names. Facebook's the latest one to try. So this study looked at companies that changed their names. But it looked at a very specific subset of companies. These companies changed their names by adding .com to their names while doing absolutely nothing in terms of changing their names. I've asked you, what's the intrinsic value effect of adding .com to, them, to my name? If I do the same thing I did yesterday, the answer is absolutely nothing, right? But here's the amazing result that the study found. On the day that these companies added .com to their names, and many were tiny companies, so the percentage increase is a little misleading, their stock prices doubled or even tripled. That's it, adding dot com. You know, we were spending 25 sessions talking about cash flows and growth and risk. The answer was right in front of us. Just change your name. Now, in case you're tempted, saying, why are we wasting our time with cash flows? Let's change our names. I'm going to quote a second study, five years later, 2002. This study also looked at companies that changed their names. You know what these companies did? They took dot com out of their names. This is after the dot-com bus. Now dot-com has become this top six component to have in your name. They took the name and their stock prices went down. What I'm trying to say is if you try to keep the market happy by feeding it one, what it wants, it might work, but markets are fickle. They change their minds. What works for them now might not work for them a year from now. Two years ago, what is a big pitch? COVID, we're a company that feeds off COVID. Now, any company that uses an argument seems to get knocked down. <coughs> For whatever reason, people have decided that that's not something you want to invest in. I don't know whether any of you read the news story. Yes, I think it was the day before yesterday in China that Alibaba, you know what happened to Alibaba stock price? The news story passed. I was on Twitter or over the wire that the Chinese government did. I think arrested somebody named Ma. That's all it says. He gave a last name. It turned out it wasn't Jack Ma. But Alibaba lost $26 billion in market cap. $26 billion on the news story. My guess is on, on Twitter. This is exactly the kind of news that passes for news on Twitter, right? Somebody puts out saying, hey, somebody named Ma got arrested by the Chinese government, $26 billion in market cap. Better find value versus price. Price can do all kinds of weird stuff in short period. So I'm going to focus on value. If you want to enhance price, I don't even know how to tell you how to do it because, in a sense, you've got to gauge the market mood and feed the market what it wants. It's got nothing to do with intrinsic value. But let's focus on intrinsic value, how you change the value of a company. So the way we set it up is there are only four levels. That determines the value of the company. The first is you can try to increase your cash flows from existing assets. And we'll go through a series of things you can do to make your existing assets generate more cash flows. So think of these as efficiency value increases, so basically making your existing assets more efficient, more profitable. Second stop, you can try to increase your value from the growth company. Now, the first reaction when I say that is that must mean reinvesting more to grow faster. Some companies, that's the answer, but in some companies, the way you increase the value to the growth component is actually growing less because your projects are making less than your cost of capital. So, increase the value. Third, you can try to lengthen the period before you become a mature company. In a spreadsheet, this is just a number, but if you think about it, what drives the value of growth is your capacity to earn more than your cost of capital. Because remember, if you grow and earn your cost of capital, it's like running in place. So this is where you bring in the fact that if you have competitive advantages, if you can strengthen them, you make your company a more valuable company because it allows you to grow them. And finally, if there's a way in which you can reduce your cost in capital, holding all its constant, that increases your value, right? Now, the obvious thing that jumps to mind if you take no corporate financial, let's change the mix of debt and equity. But that's only one of four things you can do. I'll go through the other three, but at the end of the process, everything you see in a restructuring has to fall into one of these four buckets. 
So let's take each bucket and let's look at some of the things you want to see companies do to extract value from that bucket. So I hire you as a CEO for a company. The mature company fallen on hard times. Inefficiently runs lots of fat around the company. What are the first two years of what come in? Cost cutting, more efficient operations, because basically I can squeeze the existing operation, generate higher margins. Let's say you go through that improve margins. Second stop, and this you might have to do without even mentioning it, is because your earnings are after tax. So if you can find a way to reduce taxes paid, and I'm going to cover myself fully within the framework of the law, you increase revenue, right? So when you see companies trying to move income around the world, reduce tax rates, that effectively shows up as higher value. Why? Because you're higher after tax. So you can try to squeeze higher margins by cutting costs, more efficient operations. You can try to pay less in taxes. You can also try to reduce the amount you have to reinvest to maintain existing assets. What does that mean? If you've over-invested in the past, you have excess capacity, live off the fat for a while. There's no law that says you've got to build a factory every three years. You're at 70% capacity. Maybe you can get away without building a factory for the next five years. What does that accomplish? At least for the next five years, you still get depreciation for past investment. You have no capex. You get these scenarios where your cash flow can actually be higher than your after tax operating income because you're living off excess capacity. And finally, if you're a company that has a big working capital drain on your cash flow, the retail company currently, managing working capital can do amazing things to your cash flow. And something that Walmart actually brought to the retail space because until they came along, the way retail firms manage working capital was they listen to accounting rules. I remember when I took my accounting class, I was told that a current ratio of two is what every company should aspire to. Who makes up this crap? And that's exactly what Walmart asked is why should our current assets be twice our current liability? So that basically means every year we have this huge working capital rate. Why can't we make current assets roughly equal to current liability? It's easier said than done. The way Walmart did this was this much better inventory control. Basically, when you see fewer items on the shelf, you are reducing working capital. They were tightening, they tightened up on credit. Every time you give credit without collecting interest, that's a cash break. So if you're going into a mature company, this is your first stop. See if you can extract higher cash flows from existing assets. Because if you can do that, you increase the value of the company. Let's talk about the second way to improve. Let's go back to the drivers of growth, right? Reinvestment rate, tax return on capital. So if I either increase the reinvestment rate or increase the return on capital, I increase growth, but there's this important constraint to keep in mind, which is if your return on capital is less than the cost of capital, increasing growth doesn't help me, it, doesn't, it actually makes me less value. So let's look at the two scenarios. If you're a company earning above your cost of capital, and you're not reinvesting very much. You're conservative. Remember, we looked at um, uh, uh, Hormel Foods, the, 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 the makers of uh, Spam, and they were conservative. They didn't want to go outside the US. Pushing that company to reinvest more will push up value because you can reinvest more, earn more than your cost of capital. That reinvesting more can take the form of going into new job rupees, coming up with new products. But as long as you can maintain the return on capital above the cost of capital, pushing for more reinvestment will actually increase that. But if you're earning less than the cost of capital, the opposite effect will kick in. You actually want to lower the reinvestment rate to what? To zero and below. So how can it be below zero? You can actually shrink the company, right? If you're in a business where you're earning less than the cost of capital, making your company smaller will actually make it a more valuable company because you're getting out of that. Rate. So when you're called in to increase the value from growth, the first thing you need to check is, are, am I in a good business or bad business? Because the path where you would set this company on is going to be very good. Unfortunately, we live in a world where growth is considered to be good. Higher growth is better than lower growth. And if you let consulting firms come in, they come with a menu of ways you can grow. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And it's, it's, 
distracting and confusing. So I'm going to draw on a study that one of these consulting firms does. There's a lot of stuff that McKinsey does that I don't agree with. But one of the nice things about McKinsey is it takes everything it does and it puts it into fairly well done, fairly balanced research that shows up in a quarterly magazine called McKinsey Quarterly. If you get on the McKinsey website, you can actually subscribe to it. It's free. And they take the data that they've collected, pro proprietary data on it, and use it to extract general lessons. So a few years ago, McKinsey actually looked at different ways of growing. And that's a very interesting question. Looking at the history of companies trying to grow, which are the most effective ways to go after growth in terms of creating value, and which are the least effective ways? So I'll go from best to worst. The best way to grow, if you can pull it off, is to come up with new products. So if you ask me for an example, Apple in the, ninth, in the first part of the century, like in 2000, 2010, what made Apple go from being the small company to one of the largest market cap companies in the world? The iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, new product. Now, before you jump in and say, let's all go through produce new products, it's also a growth, it's a heavily skewed. The winners make a lot of money, but it's very difficult to get away. Microsoft tried for a long time to keep coming up with new products that crashed and burned every single time. But if we can pull it off, growing through new products is the highest value creating way of creating growth. Next best way to grow is to expand an existing market. I don't know who in Bear found out that aspirin was good for hearts. You know, you, know, you take the baby aspirin every day. They change their minds on it, but for a long time, I'm sure more than two thirds of aspirin sales came from not pe from, from people not for from for pain but for you know essentially you know reducing or, or making your blood thinner so you don't end up with a heart attack or something along the way. If you can find a way to expand an existing market by finding a new use for it, second best way. The way to read this is this measures how much a million dollars invested creates in value with each approach. So with new products, a million dollars. In, in, in invested in, in new product development, on average delivers 1.75 to 2 million, but it's hugely skewed, which is you might have 20% who are winners who make 100 million and 80% losers, but that's the average. Expanding an existing market, a million dollars invested creates 0.3 to 0.75 million in additional value. So any number greater than zero means you're creating value. Next best, maintaining a growing share in a growing market. Again, okay, let me use Apple and Samsung as examples. In 2010, Apple and Samsung had big market shares of the smartphone business. But for the next seven, eight, or nine years, they were each able to grow 20, 25% a year. How? Because the business itself was growing. Same thing with Google and Facebook seven years ago. They already were dominating online advertising. But because the market itself was growing 20, 25% a year, it gave them that added, added growth. It's the advantage that Indian and Chinese companies have right now, especially a consumer product company, is you're a market that is self growing 10, 15, 20% a year. It gives you the capacity, even if you're a big company, to keep growing. And then you get to the two ways of growing that historically have not offered much promise. The first is, Competing for share in a stable market. You can get a higher growth, right? But to get a higher market share in a stable market, what do you usually have to do? You have to cut prices. You get the higher growth for a much lower margin. And historically, the net effect has been neutral or negative more often than positive. So when a company in a mature market says, look, I want to go for higher market share, History suggests that you're already fighting an uphill battle. It's going to be difficult to win. Not impossible, but difficult. And this should come as no surprise. Among the different ways of growing that McKinsey read, the worst possible way to grow is to acquisitions. We talked about why last session. So if a company says, can I create value from growth? You've got to be careful. You can't just say yes. It depends on the company. It depends on the pathway. A think like Elon Musk in three or four weeks, assuming he succeeds in Twitter, right? I mean, do you think that the payoff in Twitter is going to come from cutting costs? No. Well, you, can cut, you can fire every Twitter employee, 
But remember, your revenues are still only 5.6 billion. You're not value creation here can't come from cutting costs. So anybody who claims that Musk's plan here is to take over Twitter and lay off 30%, if that's the plan, then it's a terrible plan. Could it come from growth? I mean, I think this is what he's betting on. He's betting that there is growth. The problem is it's not quite clear what that higher growth is going to come from. There's a stock of a subscription business, but in Twitter, you can see that if there's going to be value enhancement. It's going to have to come from the growth part of the equation, not the cash flow. And as you do all of this, remember that graph that I've shown you repeatedly. If you look across the world, it's difficult to earn more than your cost of capital. So when you push companies down this growth path, you're already pushing them down a path, but most companies that try don't succeed. So you've got to have some kind of plan in mind that tells you that this company is different, that's got competitive advantages that most of the companies will. So increase cash flows with existing assets, increase the value from either increasing growth if you're in good businesses or reducing growth if you're in bad businesses. Let's move to the third way you can increase that. I don't use many strategic buzzwords, but this next three minutes will be an exception. When you think about almost everything in strategy, it's about some kind of competitive advantage. Right? And the way competitive advantages play out in valuation is the stronger your competitive advantage is, the more you can earn above your cost cap, and the longer you can maintain those investments. So I'm going to say something that's pretty obvious. If you don't have a competitive advantage, try to find it. And if you do have a competitive advantage, nurture it. So I'll give you at least four potential competitive advantages, there are probably more in every strategy book. But these are the four big ones that I can think of. The first is if you have a brand that allows you to charge a higher price, hold on to it. And you saw how much of Coca Cola's value came from its brand. Name. You say, how would I lose it? There are brand name companies that have effectively wiped out whatever power the brand name had. There was a time when AT&T might have been a synonym for reliability. I have an AT&T cell phone. It's definitely not a synonym for reliability. That, that day is gone. I'm not paying a premium for AT&T with the Verizon because I think they're going to be more reliable. Quaker Oats, brand name that was built up over a century, and then somebody just let it kind of slide to a zero. It's kind of tried to get it back. But you can see that brand names are not permanent. You can have a brand name that's valuable at one point in time that becomes less valuable over time. Coca-Cola, you know what almost risked their brand name? In the mid 80s, they thought that their competitive advantage was taste. I don't know what stupid idiot that Coca-Cola thought that this was a competitive advantage. But you know what the resulting action was, right? They spent two years coming up with this new Coke. They thought this was going to make them a more valuable company. They came out of the new Coke and people said, you go, 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 who cares? But this is what happens when you mistake what your competitive advantage is. Second is it would be nice if you could get legal protection, or at least protection from the mall. Protection from privacy with somebody you know, standing up. That's what you get with the patent, right? If you can get protection, seek it out. You say, wouldn't every company that can get protection go out and get it? You'd be surprised at what companies have let slip through their hands because they thought at the time they developed it, it was not going to be bad. When you sit in front of your Mac or your Windows now and you move the, your mouse around, you know where that technology was developed? It wasn't developed at Apple, it wasn't developed at Microsoft. It was developed by Xerox at their Park Labs. In Silicon Valley. They had this lab, but they did research. They developed this technology for kind of controlling the computer because after that, you had the you had geeks running computers, right? You couldn't delete star, 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 and everybody thought you wanted to do that. They developed the Park Lab, and nobody at Xerox thought that enough value to actually try to protect that. And what Xerox was, which is what Apple and Microsoft are worth, you can make a decision, but you can see that companies sometimes, even if they have access to legal protection, choose not to go for it because they think nobody will want this. Third, switching class. To me, this has become the big technological competitive. And here's what it is, here's what the form it takes. 
you want to make the cost of switching into your product as low as possible. But once people switch in, you want to make the cost of switching out as high as possible. You know, when I first started using spreadsheets, I used to use Lotus. And then Excel came along. And initially, your legacy effect, right? People want to use Lotus. And then they tried Excel, and then Microsoft added PowerPoint, and then they added Windows for the first office. It's an act of genius because it made the users more sticky. Because now, let's say you switch to Excel. And three years later, you decide Lotus has come out with a new update. Let me go back to Lotus. And you discovered you had a problem. You were using Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint. You had charts from Excel in there. And if you switch back to Lotus, you wouldn't be able to use those. Cell phone companies do this all the time, right? Sign in, they make it easy for you to switch. You come in three minutes, you can switch it. And once you switch in, they give you this contract that runs 15 pages in small font. Where's the time for the capacity to read that? You sign it. And then you discover you're locked in for the next five years. But who can blame them if you didn't have that? The cell phone business, the commodity business, you're going to go switching back and forth to whoever the cheapest player is. And finally, if you have a cost advantage as a company, you can benefit in one of two ways. You can charge the same prices that everybody else is charging and make a much higher margin. Or you can charge much lower prices and push other people out of the business. And this is the question Aramco probably faces every day, right? They can make money at a $25 oil price. But the one want to get to push oil prices out to $25. And get a hundred percent market share. Well, that seems to be a good idea because you have 330 million barrels of oil under the ground, you get them all out, they're all gone. So they would actually prefer that oil prices stay at a hundred, they produce less oil, they get less market share, but they make much higher margins than everybody else. When you look at a company, first thing you want to, and you probably already did this when you value your company, what was the competitive advantage? The question you ask is, is this something you can strengthen? You think as a pharmaceutical company, what can I do? I have a patent. You'd be amazed at how much money pharmaceutical companies spend hiring lawyers to extend patent lives. Because you could make these small changes, add another three or four years. Essentially, they're trying to build that competitive advantage so they can grow longer and higher price. Yes. So are these more already incorporated in our business? They are. Or they are, but they're, they're at the existing level. So let's say you've valued a company, you've already built in these, right? I now make you CEO of the company. The question I'm asking is, is there something you can do to increase your competitive advantage? Because that's going to show up as a higher value. So if you have a middling brand name, if you can make it a top brand name, the margins you can use in your top brand name valuation will be much higher than the middling brand name. And maybe that's what you would do as a company. I don't know who the CEO who came into Croc when it was a tiny company thought about the brand name, but he figured out a way for at least a few years to make it this household name. So what you're looking for is what can I do to increase my competitive advantages? Because then you can say that translates to higher margins and a longer growth period. So if you think status quo value and the value with you running the company with stronger competitive advantages, the value with you running the company should be much higher than the status quo value. And finally, you can try to reduce the cost of capital. As I said, the standard way in which people think about reducing cost of capital from a corporate finance is just stay in the mix. Use more debt, less debt, whatever it is that lowers the cost of capital. But it's one of four. Let me go through the other, other uh, uh, the, the rest of the four. If you have debt that doesn't match your assets, you know what I'm talking about? Using Turkish lira debt to, or euro debt to fund Turkish lira assets using short-term debt to fund long-term assets. You're increasing default risk of the company, right? Because of that mismatch. You increase default risk, you have a higher cost of debt over time. And by matching debt up your assets, you're in effect lowering your cost of debt. That's basically what it does. So the nice thing now is we have choices. We have ways of kind of getting that mismatch. In 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, we had a mismatch. The way you fixed it was you paid off all the debt and issued new debt. Expensive and cumbersome. Now, with swaps and derivatives, you can fix any kind of mismatch. So change the mix of debt and equity, match up your debt to your assets. 
And then I'm going to go back to two determinants of age that you might play with to make your cost accountable. Remember we said when you have a discretionary product, you said have a higher beta. So in good times, you sell a lot, in bad times, you sell If you can somehow make your product or service less discretionary, more of a necessity, you in effect lower your beta, right? So if you can take a product that people can live without it, convince them that something that they will die if they don't have. And I'll give you credit for trying. That's in effect lowering your weight and lowering your cost. Of that. And there's one final dimension that shows up with it operating leverage, fixed cost, variable cost. If you have a lot of fixed costs, it pushes up your beta and makes your income more volatile. If you can reduce the proportion of your costs that are fixed, you make your cost structure more flexible, the way it's going to show up is at a lower beta and a lower cost. <clears throat> I do believe that, that if your entire value enhancement is focused on this space, you lost the script. And in too many restructuring, I see people focus on the liability side. How do I change the mix of debt and equity? I mean, this you can try, but the real value creation has to come from the first two steps. So let's try it. I'm going to present you with a few companies, and I'm going to let you play the role of the CEO. And you're going to pick these companies. I'll try giving you the status quo. So I'm going to present the status quo that is the existing management. And you tell me possible areas that you might go and try to change to increase the value. The first company I'm going to use is SAP, German Software Company, big competitor for Oracle. And this is a valuation in 2005. So I'll cut to the chase. They're a company that's reinvesting about 57% of the after tax operating income, but earning about a 20% return on capital. With each number, you look and say, is that a number I can fix? No. Now, what are some of the things you have by the side to see if it's a number you can fix? So if I told you 20% return on capital, you can check against the cost of capital, but you also want to check against what the industry average. This is the advantage of having industry averages next to you. You can look at a manager. That looks slow. Maybe there's a good reason it's slow, but at least it gives you something to kind of take a look at when you think about changing that. This is a company that's reinvesting a reasonable amount and had a really good return on capital. But it's actually, at the time that I did this valuation, it's completely ignored Asia. Because they were a German company, they like to grow in kind of predictable areas. So it's, it's like their blind spot. They're growing, but they're not bringing in much growth from Asia. So far that away, it might be that they cannot grow in Asia. The products don't work there or whatever it is. But that's something that you see in the numbers. And if you look at their cost of capital, they're about 99% equity, 1%. Their defense is we're a technology company. Technology companies don't borrow money, which is kind of a lame justification because they have lots of earnings. They have the capacity to carry more debt. They've chosen not to borrow money because the management running the company is concerned. They don't like to borrow money. The so status quo value that I got for SAP was 106 euros per share based on the existing management. This is what you've done in your DCF, right? You've taken the existing management, you've built it, you've come up with the status quo value. I'm not asking you to do this on your DCF, but imagine being the CEO of the company you've just valued and think about the changes you might make to the company. In the case of SAP, the first thing I looked at was they have almost no debt. How much can they afford to borrow? Maybe their optimal debt ratio is 0%, in which case 1% debt is where they should be at. And what I found was that the cost of capital is minimized to about 30%. You have no debt, but based on changing the mix of debt and equity, computing the cost of capital at every debt ratio, they can be at 30%. So far that away, they can afford to carry more debt. If you add to that the fact that they reinvested at least a little bit in Asia, they could get this jump in the growth rate that they're not benefiting from more. I'm going to make two fixes. One is, I'm going to reinvest more in emerging markets. And the second is, I'm going to move to a 30% debt ratio. Those are my two big restructuring actions. And with those actions, I get a lower cost of capital and a higher growth rate. The value that I get per share is 126 euros. The value that I got with the status quo was 106 euros. The value that I get with the changes I can put in is 126 euros. What should I call that difference? Let's call it the value of control, right? This is what control means. You get to run the firm, you get to change it. The value of control at SAP is 20 euros. 
which unfortunately is really close to 20%. The bank could say, I don't use 20% got the same answer, but here's why the 20% is not going to work. But the next company I'm going to show you is a company that's no longer around, a company called Blockbuster. At the time I valued this, Blockbuster was well past its, its glory days. And Blockbuster came out of nowhere, grew through the 1990s. I mean, you, you, most of you are probably too young, but I have to remember that the Blockbuster saw pretty much every part of the country. But around 99, 2000, Blockbuster ran into a wall. Part of the wall was the market was saturated. The other part was a very young Netflix. Remember, Netflix first went after Blockbuster saying, you want a movie rather than going into a Blockbuster store, we will mail you the movie. They actually mailed it. So it was nice. Blockbuster's basic business started to employ. But Blockbuster didn't seem to notice. This often happens with companies in bad businesses. They're so caught up in what they used to do, they kept growing. The reinvestment rate of 26% basically, they're opening new stores. Nobody's coming into the existing store, so they keep opening new stores. And the return of capital they were making was 4%. So you're opening new stores, you're earning a 4% return, your cost of capital is 6.17%. You're growing, but you're destroying value as you grow. You're the new CEO of Blockbuster. So what's the first thing you're going to do the minute you walk in? I would say stop opening new stores. Right, start with that. Don't open. I mean, in your you're in a hole. Stop digging. Because if you earn less than the cost of capital and you keep growing, I mean, Starbucks has had this issue at least twice in the last twelve years, where there have been times when they kept growing and often they've had a, to have a new a change in management come in. That's often what it's taken for them to start to slow down. So when you look at the company, the value that I got for share was five dollars with the status quo. But if I just change one, one aspect of the company, the one aspect is instead of taking projects that make less than a cost of capital, take zero net cost value projects. I'm not going to ask for miracles. In fact, I'd get the same answer if I made the reinvestment rate zero in this company and stopped investing. So if I can't find new projects, to stop. The value that I get for the company is 12 and a half dollars. I've increased the value 150% by doing something. That's all I have to do is come in and say, let's stop doing things. Or send everybody home. No strategy team needed, no growth team, no store team. Just stop. The value goes from 5 to 20. Because it briefly was in the news. It actually became a target for Carl Icahn. Precisely around this time. And for the same reasons we just saw, he said, why do you guys keep opening stores when nobody's coming in? It's ruining your value. So we'll come back and talk about what that particular event of Carl Icahn entering the game changed in the picture, but you can see the huge shift in the status quo value marketplace. I did a status quo valuation of Twitter on April 4th, the day that Elon Musk took the 9.2% position. Percent position. At that time, I didn't realize he was going after the entire company. Now he's made it quite clear that he wants to acquire the entire company. And today, if you look at the news, he's kind of fleshed out the rest of the plan, which is he's going to take the company private. He's not going to keep it private for the rest of the journey. He presumably is going to change something about the business model as a private company. And then his plan is to take it back public. Now, he's not been quite clear about the plans, but I wanted to take that status quo valuation of Twitter and say, what can I do here that can make this company that has a value of 44 billion become worth 60 billion, or 70 billion, or 80 billion? You might conclude there's nothing that, that Elon Musk is just dreaming. Or you might say, if this changes and this changes and this changes, you can get to that $70 billion value. So I want to talk a little bit more about the value of control. The value of control comes from the difference between these two, right? Status quo versus option value. So we have a company that's already perfectly managed and perfectly run. This difference will go to zero, the value control goes to zero. But if you have a company that's badly managed and badly run, you're going to get a big difference between optimal value. I'm using the word optimal kind of you know, it's really important because we don't know whether this is actually optimal, it's just difference in the existing management and status quo value. 
then you have a chance of creating that. You think, why only a chance? Because for you to get that right, you've got to replace the existing management competence. Now, we haven't talked a lot about corporate governance in this class. From a corporate man class, we start the class and we spend four sessions on corporate governance. And corporate governance has taken on all these checkbox forms, right? It's course. To me, the essence of corporate governance is you get a chance to change the management of the company. That's what strong corporate governance basically means. You get the chance. You won't get the right or a guarantee, but you get a chance. So if I can somehow estimate the probability that management can change in a company, I can get an expected value for trouble. Let's say two extreme scenarios. Let's say you have a badly managed company in a country where acquisitions are impossible and the company is controlled by a family group through pyramid holdings or whatever holding structure. There's a lot of potential value control, right? But the probability of change in the company is going to be close to zero. The expected value of control can be zero because you can't change the management. In a sense, both pieces have to come together for an expected value control to be high. You would have chance of change plus the probability of change being some number that's high enough that you get a high expected value. So when you think about probability, there are things you're going to look at. You're going to look at takeover restrictions in the country, countries with significant restrictions on hostile takeovers. Because remember, almost by definition, this is going to be a hostile acquisition. Why? Because what are you telling existing managers? You guys are incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. It's very difficult to do a friendly merger after that. Hostile acquisition. There are lots of countries where hostile acquisitions are still viewed as something that shouldn't go through. Long time in Europe, hostile acquisitions were never, you know, you didn't have hostile acquisitions. You couldn't get financed because you had to go borrow from the bank. The bank wouldn't lend you money through a hostile acquisition of fiat, even if you thought fiat was the worst run company in the face of Second, you're going to look at voting rights and rules. Let's assume that you think Facebook could be more valuable, run differently. There's not much you can do about it, right? Because the voting shares are controlled by Mark Zuckerberg, it's going to be very difficult to get that change done because getting management to change is going to be very difficult. So it depends on access to funds. If you're in a country where raising capital to do an acquisition is really difficult to do, the expected value control is going to be far lower than if you can raise the capital to do the acquisition. There's a reason you, the US has been at the center of struggles for control and hostile acquisition. It's easiest to raise capital in the US. And think about it Elon Musk is borrowing $30 billion, not against Twitter's assets but against this Tesla holdings as a company. In most of the world, that would be impossible to do. But because you can do this, Tesla is now in play as a potential target for acquisition. And finally, we have to be realistic. If you thought Microsoft was badly managed, I would just say, that, let it go. You think Apple is badly managed? Again, let it go. What are you going to do? It's a $3 trillion company. That like, call I can't try, right? About 10 years ago. And then you realize very quickly, this is too big a company for me to even make a debt. All those factors will come into that problem. So when you think about this probability factor and assessing it, a couple of things I think need to be put on the table. First is, well, rules can change over time. 20 years ago, we asked me for that about the chances of a hostile acquisition in Germany, but it's not going to happen. Today, Rules across the EU allow for more challenging and incumbent managers. Same thing is for many emerging markets. You've gone from not being able to challenge managers at least getting a chance. Second, active investors clearly play a big role in creating this problem. Bill Ackman, Carl, I mean, Carl Icahn, Bill, you know, Bill Ackman, essentially, the minute they enter into the game, they change the property, right? When you read that no news story that Carl I can take three percent, what he's saying might make no sense for the company, but he's now shaking the board. Things are going to change in the company. And finally, the minute you have a hostile acquisition in a sector, it shakes up everybody else in that sector. You do a hostile acquisition of one steel company, it's not just that steel company breaks up and say, Oh my god, this can happen. It's every steel company. 
So sometimes all you need is one hostile acquisition for people to wake up and then that could happen. So actually estimating the property of change is difficult, but you can at least get a subjective judgment. But if you actually want to get a number, there's a technique called a probe. It's like a regression. In a probe, what you do is you try to estimate the probability of something happening. I'll give you an example of how this works out with hostile acquisition. Let's say you want to estimate the probability of a hostile acquisition of the company. And you hire me and I'm a statistics major. I go back and I collect over the last 10 years data on every company. Companies that were both acquired in hostile acquisition and companies that were. For every company that was acquired in a hostile acquisition, I'm going to put a one next to a company. For every company that wasn't, I'll put a zero. And then I start listing out all the things that I think might affect whether a company is taken over in a hostile acquisition. I might look at how the stock price has done over the last five years, because the hypothesis companies whose stock price has done badly are more likely to become targets of an acquisition. I might bring in the structure of the board. Smaller boards tend to be more effective, so I look at how big the board is. And there's empirical data on each of them. So let's say I have the zero ones, so I have 10,000 companies, 500 were acquired, 9,500 were not. I get the data from each of these variables. Do you know how we run multiple regression, right? We have a dependent variable, we have independent variable. In a probe, the multiple variables become that zero one variable. And the dependent variables become all these things that drive us. When you're done, it's going to look just like a regression equation. But now, if you plug in your company's stock price performance, your company's board size into that regression, you're going to come up with a predicted number of 0.33. You think, what does that mean? There's a 33% chance that your company will be taken over, given its characteristics. It's a way of taking the data and using it to actually estimate the likelihood of an acquisition. Have you wondering where this expected value control plays out? Now, it, it plays out every publicly traded company. When you look at its stock price, the stock price is not a status quo value. It's always a weighted average of the status quo value of what the market thinks this company could be worth to somebody who runs the thing. How much the weight that will depend on the company? Facebook, the weight might be close to zero for somebody else running the company. But a company like Kraft Heinz, it might be 70% chance that the existing managers run it. 30% of somebody else. Expected value control is part of every stock. In every hostile acquisition, when you value control, this actually becomes an explicit number, right? Because you're paid for this change in value from running the company differently. But I'll tell you where I find this most useful. Now, increasingly in the US, we're now facing companies with two classes of shares. One has 10 voting rights, one has one voting rights. You look at Google, you look at Facebook, you look at pretty much every big tech company that's gone public since, since 2004. Now, intuitively, we know that the shares with higher voting rights should trade the premium over shares with low voting rights. In some countries, there are shares with voting rights and shares without voting rights. All of Latin America, you have common shares and preferred shares. The preferred shares in Latin America are really common shares without voting rights. So intuitively, we know that voting shares should trade at a premium. But if you ask how much, people start making up. They look at other traders and say, typically it's 5% to 10%, basically based on studies, and they point to empirical studies. But here's a much better way to think about voting shares versus non-voting shares. When you buy a non-voting share in the stock, you're stuck with the status quo, right? Just think about it. You have no way of changing money. So I ask you what the value per share is. You take the status quo value, you divide by the total number of shares outstanding, you get the value per non-voting share. With a voting share, what do you get? You get a chance to change the way the company is run. To the extent that there's a value to control, you get to claim that entire value as a voting share member. So when I look at the value per voting share, I'm going to take the non-voting share value plus the portion of the expected value control that you get as a voting share. It's a way which I can actually tell you what the premium should be for a voting versus a non voting share. So, I want to take examples of each of these places where the expected value control plays out. First, let's talk about hostile acquisitions. Now, basically, you know, hostile acquisition is this value out there, and acquirer pays a higher value for the company. 
And it's usually driven by I can change the way the company is. So let's go back to Blockbuster. The status quo value was five dollars. The optimal value is twelve fifty. No, it was and stock was actually trading at nine fifty in July of two thousand five. So the market was not trading at five dollars because it saw that change could come. It wasn't changing at twelve trading at twelve and a half dollars because the change hasn't come yet. It was trading at nine fifty. If you ask me, can I estimate the if I to the extent that I can that I believe the five dollars and the twelve dollars, I can actually estimate the probability of change the market is built into the current stock. If I pay the twelve forty seven per share to acquire Blockbuster, I'm essentially getting a neutral investment, right? Because I've essentially paid the full value. So if I'm an acquirer, I have the twelve dollars and forty seven cents. I have the 950, but I don't want to pay the entire premium. I want to get away paying less than $12.47. Because I want to keep some of it for myself because I'm doing the work of fixing this company. So when you value control, be careful not to give it away as a premium because some of that should belong to you because you're doing the dirty work of creating the value. As I said, you can actually back out from the price what the market is attaching at the property of, of control chain. So you remember the value I got per share was 513. The optimal value is 1247, stocks trading at 950. The market is attaching a 59 and a half percent chance that control will change. And this happened after ICAP showed up. Before he showed up, the stock price was actually much lower. In fact, the price, stock price was, I think, $8 per share. The minute he showed up, the stock price went from 8 to 9.50. The company didn't become more valuable, but the likelihood of change shifted the minute he showed up. And this is why you're an investment company. When you see car like that show up, doesn't matter whether you agree with them or not, almost instantaneously, you're going to get a bump in your stock price because of nothing else is shaking up management. Say, maybe you should be running the company differently. That's why I felt that even if Musk had withdrawn his offer in the middle of April, Twitter's value would have been different, or the price would have been different because now you open the door to a change is possible. Maybe Musk couldn't do it, but maybe somebody else could do it. Any questions on the on using the stock price back to Musk? So there's there are my end values in the property. So let's talk about voting and non voting shares. As I said, if you have a non voting shares, you get a piece of the status quo. Value. If you have voting shares, you get also a piece of the value of control. So you get that trade. So I'm used, going to use the example of a company called Embraer, which is in an aerospace company. So let's say so a few years ago, I did a status quo value for Embraer, 12 and a half billion Brazilian reacts. Their optimal value came up at 14.7 billion. So at least in theory, there's a $2.2 billion increase in value you can get if you ran and brought it. The company had 242.5 million voting shares and 477 million non voting shares. So here's my task. I have two values, that is for an optimal value. I'm voting and non voting shares. I'd like to use this information to tell you what the value should be for a non voting share. And then add to it the estimate of what the value should be for a voting share, how much it improves. So let's start with the easier half first. Let's estimate the value of a non voting share. I took the status quo value, 12.5. I divided by the total number of shares I said, voting and non voting. And the value per share that I got was 17.38 reais per share. So non voting share, you start with the status quo value. I give you a piece of the status quo value. And then I took the difference, 12 and a half, uh, 14.7 minus 12 and a half billion. I estimate only a 20% chance that it could change because Embraer is still very much a government controlled company. The Brazilian government used to be Brazilian, it used to be entirely owned by the government. It's not as heavily controlled as Vale or Petrobras, but the Brazilian government has a pretty heavy say in what happens at the company. So that's a 20% chance. That you could change management. I took the difference in value, 14.7 minus 12.5, and divided just by the voting shares because they get that value of control. And I get a value of 19.19 reais. The voting shares would trade the premium of roughly 1.81 reais per share, but that's a little over 
But think about what will make that number larger or small. First, if the Brazilian government tomorrow says, nobody is going to be able to change the bribe, we decide to shut all the doors and lock them. The 20% is going to go to zero. The voting shares are going to converge to the non voting shares. That's one way that two will converge. The second is if tomorrow, Brazil, if it arrives, management decides to run the company optimally, they come up to, they have a special weight. And the status quo value becomes the optimal value, the two shares will converge. You see where I'm going? When you're voting in non voting shares in a company, if the chance of control changing is close to zero, they should trade at roughly the same price. You know, you can go, you can check, check this in your Facebook at class A, class B shares. Given that the chance of change in Facebook is close to zero, I'd expect them to trade at roughly the same price. The, more, the worse run a company is, and the greater the chance you have of changing the way the company's run, the larger the difference between voting and non voting. Any questions on voting and non voting shares? So do the status quo value, the optimal value, and then from that you can answer the question about voting and non voting shares. And finally, there's an aspect of minority company valuation that has not talked about. Do you have a minority, you have a private, I'm sorry, a private company that has talked about. Let's say you have a private company. And I try to buy 51% of your private company, and you're going to own the remaining 49%. The price I pay when I bid for 51% can be very different from the price I would pay if you sold me only 49%. It's only a 2% difference, right? But the difference is if I own 51%, I get to run the company. But if I own 49%, you get to run the company. Any Mets fans here? No Mets fans? You don't want to admit it? They're the best record in the National League, right? Until two years ago, who ran the Mets? Nobody wants to see the Wilcox, right? And the Wilcox couldn't run a lemonade stack. I mean, this is a family that lost, I don't know, how many millions of billions of Madoffs. And for the last 12 years, the Mets have been in receivership. The Wilcox couldn't afford to pay the money. Steve Cohen entered the Mets ownership structure as a minority owner. If you're Steve Cohen and I offer you 6% of the Mets, then I'm the Wilcox. How should you value it? You should value it as badly run baseball team. Because you have a history of running the team bad. But if you're Steve Cohen, I offer you 51% of the Mets, all of a sudden the game changes entirely, right? Because now you get to run the company and you can, I'm sorry, run the team and you can run it very differently. So put simply, if you offer me 49% of the company, I'm going to pay 49% of the status quo value because I don't control how the business is run. And status quo value is 1.6 billion, I'll pay 784,000. If I, if you offer me 51% of the company, I'll be willing to pay up to 1.02 million because I now run the company. It's called a minority discount in private company valuation. Where if you buy a minority stake in a company, you discount your valuation because you don't get to run the company. So I know people use the word control premiums and minority discounts. It's basically the percentage is to come out of nowhere. But at least now you have the mechanism that you can use to determine when that number should be large and when it should be close to zero. It's a really question. Any questions on value control? So I'm going to close the value enhancement section by looking at how consultants package and sell value enhancement. First, if you're a consulting firm, you can't sell value enhancement as cash flows growth and risk. You know what? Yes, I know that already. So the first thing that often happens when, when you see these, when you see consulting firms sell value enhancement to companies is they will say, look, you know, this is too complicated, lots, lots of stuff. We'll pick a variable that you should focus on instead, and that will give you a higher value. Just focus on getting higher cash flows, higher return on capital, higher market share. Or best of all, they create an acronym, EBA, CFROI. And you say, what's that? It's a magical potion. We know how to do it, but if you maximize this, your value will go. You can see why CEOs eat this up, right? This is kind of cash flow valuation, all these moving, moving things, different things. You just keep your eyes on this one number. Just keep it on your desk every morning, keep track of it. 
typically. The advantage of these simplistic value management devices is they yeah. easy to use. The disadvantage is whenever you take a simplified assumption, you're holding other things constant, and often those things become back to back. So I'll give you an example with two measures that came out towards the end of the last century that you still see in use in different parts of the world. The first was a measure called economic value added or EVA. It was concocted. Notice what I use concocted. Because that suggests there's no depth to it. By an outfit called Stern Stewart, co-founded by two men, Joel Stern and Bennett Stewart, who could sell refrigerators to Eskimos but really didn't know that much about corporate sense, but they created a firm, they sold it. I'll tell you what EVA is and what it tells companies, and you tell me whether you find anything surprising. EVA measures the difference between return on capital and cost of capital. That's incredible, right? Nobody ever thought about that until they came along. It's fantastic. And then they say, the bigger that excess return, the better you are as a company, and the, more, and the, the larger the capital you can earn that, that excess return on, the more valuable you become. So it's all about excess returns and what kind of investments you can make. But the, the way they sold it was all you need to focus on is EVA. If you increase EVA, you make your company more valuable. Think of how much simpler it is than doing a full fledged discounted cash flow. CFROI was created by a second group of consultants called Holt Associates. And they said EVA is like NPV, it's a dollar value. I know you like a percentage number. And rather than use this accounting return on capital, which is built on accounting earnings and not based on cash flow, let's do an IRR. That's what a CFR away. And look at the IRR. What's the rule? You need to earn an IRR higher than your cost of capital. And if you earn a higher IRR, you're more valuable as a company. In effect, they took the ETF and just framed it in terms of these metrics, and they sold them as magic. I have no problem with doing this, but the bottom line is the value of a firm is not going to change because you slice and dice the cash flow system. The value of a firm cannot be affected by the fact that you use a different metric to capture the same thing. In fact, I have an entire paper showing that EVA and ETF pretty much give you the same number. Let's take it pretty much out. They give you the same number. You're just slicing and dicing the cash flow system. So one of my problems with, with, with when you when you use these shortcuts is to ask the question. What can go wrong? Because whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So let me use let me use a simple example to illustrate how EVA and DCF give you the same answers, and then talk about what will happen if I turn my managers loose and tell them to just go increase it. So let's say I have a firm which has a book value of capital of hundred. Why does book value of capital matter? Any time you have an excess return model, remember you need a return on capital, a return on equity. Which means you need a book back, so it becomes a big part of the problem. Let's say this company expects to earn a 15% return on cash flow on this capital invested in perpetuity with a cost of capital of 10%. So they're earning a 5% excess return every year for us on the 100%. But they're not done. Every year for the next five years, they're going to make additional investments of 10 million new projects. Those new projects will also earn more than the 5%, more than the cost cap, 5% more than the cost cap every year. After year five, the game stops. You're no longer able to take excess return projects. Why? Because your competitive advantage is a fail. I'm going to try to value this company with what's called an excess return model or an EVM. People often say this is different. It's different from DCF. Let's see if it is. This company. No, after your five, as I said, lower the cost of capital, go five percent. So here's what I did. First, I took the five percent excess return on the existing capital. So that's still five percent of 100 million is five million. Every year, forever, the perpetuity, the cost of capital is 10 percent. So that's a 15 million dollar added value from existing. So you start with the book value, you add the excess value, the present value, the excess return from existing capital. That's 15 million. Then I add the present value of EVA from investments year one, year two, year three, year four. Again, doing the same thing, but then just counting them back to the present. You think what happens after year five? Remember, after year five, you earn your cost of capital. So there are more, no more excess returns. If I add up that last column, the book value of capital plus the present value of excess returns, I come up with 170 points. So if I was Stuart, I'm going to come here and say, look, this is a new way of valuing companies. It's a different way of valuing companies. 
it's a better way of value company. If you use the EVA approach, the value for your company is 170 billion. Let's have old fashioned. I said, what would my value be if I used the DCF approach? So here's what I did. I took the numbers you saw in the EVA approach and converted them into a more conventional DCF. What does that mean? I came with the total after tax operating income. I subtracted out the capex, which is a project investment. I came up with the free cash flow of the first. You discount the free, and after year five, I put them into stable growth and came up with the terminal value. But let me cut to the chase. If I discount those cash flows back to the present using a 10% cost of capital with an old fashioned DCF model, the value that I get is 170.85. So let's see what the newfangled approach delivered 170.85. What I get with the DCF, 170.85. So why am I paying Stearns two and a half a million dollars to come in and put old wine into new water? There is nothing in excess return models that brings anything new to the process. You know what excess return models do? Is they take your existing cash flows and they split them into two parts. They take one part and they say, that's the return capital. So basically they say, if you are the cost of capital, that's the cost of your cash flow. And they take whatever's above that and treat that as a separate cash flow. But present value is your additive. Just because I've broken cash flow into two parts and discounted each part separately cannot give me a discount. Of course, whenever I bring it up, people say, so what? It's true, EVA did bring some insights to companies, and especially if you're a stupid company or a short sighted company. We use. First is, it made the point that we just We've been talking about all, all semester, which is growth by itself is not what creates value. It's growth with excess returns. So by focusing so much on excess returns, it re-emphasized that fact. So that's a good, that's good. And second, it gave you a way of thinking about why some companies have much higher market values than book value. The EVA approach, think about it. All of the excess amount comes from earning more than your cost of capital. If I made every project earn the cost of capital, the market value is going to converge on the book value. Of course, we know this already because when you did price to book ratios, what do we look at? Return equity minus growth. So in a sense, it's not new again, but again, maybe companies needed that reminder about the whole being about earning more than the cost of capital. But here's the downside. Once EBA became the standard in many companies, in the mid-19s, for instance, the point in time, where half of the S&P 500 companies were paying Stern Stewart consulting fees to compute their EVA. You say, why do they need Stern Stewart to do it? Well, here's why. Here's what Stern Stewart did, and they're not unique among consulting firms. What's our measure for ROIC? What do we do? We say after tax operating income and divide by book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. So Stern Stewart said that's an accounting number. There are all kinds of problems with accounting. We agree, right? And then they gave us 164 adjustments, proprietary adjustments, they call them, to book value and operating income. Four of those adjustments, you know what they were, right? Leases, things like R&D. What were the other 160? They were smoke screen. Why do you need the smoke screen? Well, you now need Stern Stewart to come in and tell you what your return investment capital is. So every six months, Stern Stewart would come make this expedition out to your company, charge you a half a million dollars, say your new updated ROIC is 12.83%. Then they go away. But they, the worst aspect of this, once companies adopted EVA, they started tying management compensation to year to year changes. And now we're entering into very dangerous territory. We're rewarding managers for pushing the EVA, which is an annual number, ROIC minus cost of capital, for pushing it up from year to year. Think of all the ways you can push up your, R your EVA next year. First is, you can, of course, earn, take better projects, earn more. But you can also reduce the capital invested in existing projects, right? I'll give you an example. If you don't capitalize leases, but you treat as capital expenditures what I borrow money to buy, I'm increasingly going to lease everything to make my EVA look better. There are cosmetic things I can do that can increase my EVA. I'll get a bonus for doing it, but I'm really not helping you. But here's what I want to think about. There are three games that, that you saw played around EVA. You still see them played anytime you see companies reward management based on excessive First is what I call the growth trade-off. What does that mean? 
you push up the EVA for next year, but at the cost of EVA for future years. In other words, you go for a short-term project that increases operating income next year, but by giving up a long-term project that might have increased the present value of EVA by a lot more over the next 10 years. That's bad for you as owners and shareholders of the company, but it's great for the manager because they collect the bonus. The second is what I call the risk game. EVA is return on capital minus cost of capital, right? But cost of capital constantly has to be adjusted if I get into risk and risk your business. But let's say I, there's a lap between the time I get into a risky business and my cost of capital reflection. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to push into riskier businesses, push up my EVA, and by the time the risk catches up with you five years later, I'm going to another firm. It's a risk trade off. And finally, we talked about the capital investment which is you want less and less stuff in your invested capital. You want to make your book equity as small a number as possible. You're going to do everything you can to keep your job. Again, by doing things that could hurt the firm. So when you think about EVA, it's not going to deliver higher value necessarily by, you know, just because they were higher EVA. So when you look at consulting firms and they market things like EVA, CFR, is there a new version that you said? So I, I've come up with a list of like five or six that I've seen just in the last year or two mm. that claim to be investor week, new ways of increasing value. Step back and be skeptical. There's very little valuation that needs reinvestment. Maybe real options, you can bring that in, but nothing slicing and dicing cash flows in this country is going to give you better the value. So I will see you on Monday for the last month, and hopefully I will see your numbers by then. Okay. I will also have an uh, office hours on Friday to take your questions specifically for the project. Because some of you might be stuck on fraud, small questions. So I'll send you the email for when I'm Friday. Not sure if you saw my email about my discretion. I only only one of us has any specific variables. Then, like the value that I'm getting, to see if I'm gonna get it. You plugging in today's margin or expected margin? You don't want to plug in today's number, you want to plug in the forecast of future number to get a future value and it starts back. What you have right now might not be. Yeah, I can see Right now, numbers are small and you're not that good. Okay. Yes.